All right, guys. So what we are going to start uh, this course with is in the topic of thermodynamics. All right. So what we are going to learn today a little bit, you know, just sort of like warm things up, is talking about thermodynamic system and see how it goes. And I think maybe the, the key one is the temperature. Just talk about this one more time, even though you guys are already familiar with this a lot. But we're going to talk from the perspective of physics. What does temperature really mean? All right. And with that, then you'll have a chance to um, listen to me talking about the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So weird. <laughs> right. I mean, just like, hey, why, why zeroth law? Okay. And I think we can end today lecture with a little bit of application or something that is easy to see and easy to calculate, which is thermal expansion and why there is some expansion due to temperature change. So that's why we have a thermal adjective in the front. It's a thermal expansion. All right. And the business about matters, the gas and all the Latin heat, we can do it on Saturday. Okay. All right. So it's going to be a breeze over here. So I think maybe the first question that comes into your mind is, why do we need to study this one? All right. Or why do we need to study physics at all? <laughs> maybe. All right. But anyway, the point is you have already learned Newtonian physics. So sigma f equal to ma works so well, right? Well, Dan, that was really good. Even though you probably have heard of like quantum physics and all this stuff, you might have heard of maybe relativity, you know, some sort of like Einstein theory of relativity and all this stuff. However, within the, 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 how can I say, the system that you can treat them classically, sigma f equal to ma seems to work already. Okay, so what else do we need? Okay, so I would like to start the motivation of this particular topics by asking you a very simple question. If you look around you, maybe you are sort of like sitting in a room or maybe some, in, you know, some area that's pretty close in space and other stuff. So, and then you look around and I'm asking you how many oxygen molecules, the oxygen molecules or two should be around you. I mean, you know, within the room, what should be the numbers? What do you think? Whoa. Right, maybe you don't need this motivation over here. <laughs> what kind of, I mean, what I can ask you just the order of magnitude. Like, could it be like 100, 10 million, you know, stuff like that. So what do you think? Oxygen molecule around you, just look around and just come up with an approximated number. All right, very good. Here we go. There's a billion that's popping up, 10 to the 23rd ish. <laughs> very good. All right, so that's exactly what I'm talking about is huge. Whatever the numbers that come into your mind, it's going to be like a big, big number, right? The billions is already big, but actually that was pretty good. The numbers that tend to the 23rd over there, I think you are thinking of something related to Avogadro numbers that you probably used in chemistry. Does that make sense? I'm just reading your mind right there. So you probably have heard of like one mole, okay? One mole. And that is equal to about 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd number of molecules or atoms on and off, all right? So it's a big, big number. Okay, here comes the next question. So now you imagine that big number right there. It could be million, 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 million. I am asking for total kinetic energy of those molecules in your room. I want the total kinetic energy of all those molecules that's running around in your room. Can you find out for me <laughs> what is this number? But you guys are done. And it can be done because everyone knows as long as those molecules doesn't really travel so fast that you have to worry about like speed of light and other stuff is one half mv squared. And all you need to do is just sum them up, one half mv squared. So what's the big deal about this? Newton's just, you know, told you everything already. Yeah, you're right. But then you imagine that you have to sum this number 10 to the 23rd time. Then your jobs become enormous, even though you know how to do it. And then you probably can, can get it done using like supercomputer on the stuff. But to sum all this big number is not an easy task. Second of all, before you can sum this number, you probably come up with this. Well, you have to know first what is the speed of those oxygen molecule, right? So what is this? Now, the problem is harder. It's not just summing the numbers. 
The problem is you have to do some monitoring or some detection, or you have to, you know, scan the the, the molecules or whatever in your room. So you might put a camera, super high speed camera, whatever, detecting how fast these molecules is traveling. But then you still have problems because it's a million, million, million molecules, first of all. And the second of all is they can collide with each other. They can knock, even though you can, you know, measure the speed of these molecules at one particular time. But you know, just a split second later, that speed might have already changed by knocking the wall, knocking the neighboring atoms, knocking this and that. Who knows? So I would say this is impossible. Is it? <laughs> so this is a question that you don't have answer, true or false. Is that true that Ajahn, this kind of question you shouldn't ask because it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't mean that we don't know how to do it. We know how because we know Newtonian physics, but we just don't have enough resource to do it. But it turns out that is an answer, believe it or not. Whoa, seriously. And it turns out this can be solved by measuring temperature. Is that wow, wow, wow moment here, guys? <laughs> I don't know. But first time I'm, I'm sort of like learning about this whole facts over here is kind of like a little bit amazing in the sense that, whoa. When I say whoa, it means the temperature is just a single number, right? Single number. How can single number eventually lead you to something so big, so huge, enormous stuff? The reason is because it's something related to statistic. It's a stat. It's statistics come into play. So of course, all of those oxygen molecules won't be traveling at the same speed. Some traveling slowly, some moving so fast, doesn't matter. But at the end, you will get some distribution of those. Let's call this a speed, and this is probably the number of molecule. You can do this. But then it turns out you already learned from statistics. Every time you have some distribution, you can have some statistical parameters to characterize those distribution, right? And it turns out temperature is just right there. This mean the average value of this stuff, I mean, oh, well, not exactly temperature, but the average of this distribution is linked directly to the temperature, guys. Okay. Seriously. And that means you can take this room to any corner of the universe as long as this room having exact same temperature. The distribution of all those molecules that is running around will have exactly same distribution. <laughs> yes, no? Isn't that like, wow? Or is this like, well, oh, Dan, so what's the point? <laughs> so my point is, this is amazing in the sense that there is a way that you can treat a system that has a really, really big number, but you don't have to really, really use Newtonian physics from the ground up or from scratch. You have another approach that you can do it in a collective way. When you say collective, mean you can think of it in a macroscopic level. You can look, look at this room just like, okay, this is a, a room that containing oxygen molecules. And we are going to take this whole room and treat them as a system. And that is your thermodynamic system, guys. Okay. Does that make sense to you at all? Okay, so this is going to complement Newtonian physics that you have learned before. Okay, now you had the limitation that Newtonian physics won't take you to the system that has a big, big, big numbers in the system. But luckily, you can treat those big number system using statistics. And with the combination of statistics and Newtonian physics, here comes thermodynamics. Isn't that fun? <laughs> Ajahn, do we know what kind? Yes, it turns out, yes, we know exactly what kind of distribution is that. And while it's not the one that you're familiar with, it's not like bell shape, it's not exponential, it's not binomial, it has its own distribution, right? It's, I think it's called Boltzmann distribution there. 
but it has a uh, exponential terms in it. Yep. Cool. All right. So that's. I hope you get some motivation here. So what we are trying to do over here is just look at uh, look at the system in the macroscopic level. So we are going to have a bunch of variables that characterize our system that don't need to look into a fine detail. And the first thing is temperature. Okay, so we already know now that temperature links directly to the total kinetic energy of the system. Isn't that cool? Okay, so just to give you some motivation over here. So if you would like to measure the temperature, the way that you do it usually just by you know testing or measuring using some device. And those device could be named like thermometer, right? And every time you want to measure it, you have to put them in contact somehow. So look at this one, right? You have thermometer. You want to know what is the temperature of this liquid. You have to put them in thermal contact. So here come this one technical term over here. You just put them in contact. And if they are at the same temperature, you guys know, if they are at the same temperature, nothing is going to happen. But if, 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 if your thermometer is a little bit hot, and your liquid is kind of cold, then you guys know eventually there will be some exchanging of heat and we're going to talk more about heat later, okay? okay. Right, but there will be something going on. There will be some dynamics going on. But then at the end, everything will stop when you reach an equilibrium. So you also going to talk about this one, equilibrium. But this equilibrium is going to be different from the mechanical equilibrium that you learn from Newtonian physics because that mechanical equilibrium, you base everything on forces, right? You do moments, you might do torque, you might do things like that. But over here, it's the equilibrium that you reach by looking at its temperature. So that's why we call this thermal equilibrium. It's so simple. The concept is quite simple, right? You put an ice into a, a cup of hot water, eventually they're gonna reach some final temperature. That means you already reached equilibrium, something like that. Okay, so with that here, it's so simple that they forgot <laughs> somehow, our physicist forgot to put it in like a first law of everything. So they already defined the first law of thermodynamics at the time. And they feel like, they felt like this, concept of thermal equilibrium, thermal contact is so important and it's supposed to be fundamental of everything. So they just put it in front of the first law and hence the zeroth law of thermodynamics, guys. Okay. <laughs> this is the only thing that physicists can do, right? So no one else will be able to do this kind of thing. All right, so the zero law says, if object A and object B are separately in thermal equilibrium with another object C, then we are guaranteed that once you put A and B in thermal contact, they are already in thermal equilibrium. Does that easy enough? Yeah, well, that's common sense because object C is just our thermometer. So if you put thermometer, that's our object C, touch with the A, and then you read 22.5. You put our thermometer, touch it with the B, it's also read 22.5. You are guaranteed that the A and B must be in, at thermal equilibrium when they are put in thermal contact. Sounds cool? All right, sounds cool, and just let it go, right? <laughs> There's nothing else to it, all right? It's so common sense that everyone agree with this. All right, now, so in terms of reading out, all right, so you must have some scaling. So you want to be able to set the, the scale or you want to know like, hey, what's the temperature? How high is the temperature? How low is the temperature? So you must have some sort of like a numerical the representation of the level of the temperature. So there is some scaling that you can you know, use for temperature and one that you use the most probably in Celsius scale. Okay, so you go from zero to 100, that's from the freezing point of water to a boiling point of water. Okay, that's fine. But then you have another scale that is so important to us and it's called absolute temperature scales. The reason for this one is called absolute because of this. And I don't want to bore you guys with this experiment anymore. I think for those of you that came from chemistry, I think you have already seen this experiment. But this experiment is just sort of like looking at the behavior of gas when you're changing the temperature. And it turns out if you try to plot between the pressure of that gas in the container and the temperature, 
no matter what gas you use, gas number one, gas number two, gas number three, doesn't matter. It seems to follow the same trend in the sense that when you lower the temperature, the pressure will drop along with it. And it's mostly in a linear fashion as well when the gas is not super high pressure or anything. So what they say, what they can do is just like, of course, they're not going to you know, lower the temperature down to super low, but at least they have a trend. So when they have a trend, they can extrapolate those trends. And it turns out, no matter what kind of gas you use in this experiment, they're going to meet at one single point. So they got an idea that that must be the absolute temperature that every gas has to meet. And that is the point where the pressure is gone. When the pressure is gone means nothing is moving, <laughs> right? Okay. And when nothing is moving, we already know that's when there's no temperature. Does that make sense? So what I would like for you to get at this point is this, guy. So this is going to sound really weird. Let's think backward a little bit. Imagine that you are just a single particle in the universe just single particle, no structure, not even like a diatomic. You don't have even like O2, not even H2. Just if you are a hydrogen, it's going to be just a hydrogen atoms. Or even worse, actually, hydrogen is still have some structure in it. Let's say you are just an electron, <laughs> proton or whatever, just super fundamental nothingness here in, inside you. There's nothing there. Okay. So let's say you are the only particle in the universe. Imagine that. It's black, it's dark, there's nothing, it's vacuum, there's nothing there. No movement, no nothing. Very nice, very peaceful there. Eh? <laughs> okay. okay, now let's say somehow I can warm it up by giving it some energy. Okay, that doesn't make sense, right? I shouldn't light the fire in the vacuum, that's not possible. Okay, but anyway, somehow. I can give this particle some energy, maybe shine a laser light on it or something like that. My question is, what should happen to this particle, guys? Imagine that. Hmm. Just like, okay, then this particle receives some energy. What will it do with that energy? Yeah, very good. It will increase in velocity. So it's just going to move. There's nothing else for it to do. It actually is going to have to travel because it doesn't have to, uh, they don't know what to do with the energy. And the reason that I still don't want to call in the spin, when I'm, I'm talking about the spin, I hope this is just like classical spin, like spinning top. All right. I hope you're not talking about like a spin up, spin down of electrons. <laughs> All right. So you're not going to have any spin yet because this particle has no structure. So you don't have any sizing. You don't have no width. There's no height. That's nothing. So there's nothing to spin even. So the only thing that this particle can do is just travel. And that's, guys, this is it. At first, when you have no velocity, that's when you are at zero Kelvin. And the Kelvin, the K, is the unit for absolute temperature scale. Cool? Once you give it some energy, it's travel. So it means it has some kind of the energy in there. That's one half mv square, right? And that's when your temperature is going to be greater than zero Kelvin. All right. So I hope you see the connections I'm trying to get to here. All right. I want to emphasize again and again that temperature is just the total kinetic energy of the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you reach this temperature right here, when you're extrapolating curve over here, hitting the single point over there, that's when you assume that is your absolute zero temperature. Okay? All right. So that's why it is. So the absolute zero temperature is just a temperature that nothing is moving. Makes sense. Because there's no energy there. Okay. There's a question comes in. If electron is excited to higher energy states, the energy exists in the form of its velocity, right? I would say yes. Yes. However, if you talk in this language over here, I would call this language to be quantum physics-ish, sort of. So when you have an excited state, so it means your system is not like an isolated single particle system anymore. Does that make sense? 
The reason that you can excite it, it means that electron must be within some influence of potential energy. So you are not alone. <laughs> so anyway, for those of you that don't, I mean, don't, don't into this one, that's fine. I'm just trying to answer this question is, when the electron has an excited state, that means that electron is not alone in the universe. It must be under the influence of other things. Okay, that's my take on this one. Okay. And yes, it has some velocity. I mean, it has some kinetic energy in there. Yeah. Okay, very cool. All right, so just to confirm again, the absolute zero, that's when nothing is moving. However, however, just a quick pause over here before you, you know, digress too far here. Unfortunately, the zero point, uh, the zero temperature or the zero Kelvin that we're talking about here is unreachable. <laughs> And this is a third law of thermodynamics, guys. All right? You can, I don't know, you can call this a third law of thermodynamics or you can say, I mean, we can talk about this from the perspective of quantum physics. Nothing in this universe is actually standing still. That's pretty much what it is. All right? So nothing is actually at zero speed. So that means something must be wiggling, something must be moving. So that means zero Kelvin is impossible in our universe. Too bad. All right. Okay, guys. So that's what it is. The Kelvin, where did I say it? Okay, not here. Okay. So the Kelvin, the K, the K, where's the K? How come it's not here? It must be somewhere. All right. But anyway, if not here, I can just write it down. This is Kelvin scale. There you go. All right. And the good thing about this Kelvin and the Celsius relationship is simple. They are just linear. Linear in the sense that it's just addition of numbers. So if you have uh, temperature in Celsius, you just add 273, right? If you want to be more accurate, 0.15, then you just convert from Celsius to Kelvin scale. You're done. So the good thing about this one is the change of the temperature in Celsius scale is going to be exactly the same as the change of the temperature in the Kelvin scale. Or you can say that the resolution between these two scales are exactly the same. One degree change in Celsius is exactly the same as one degree change in Kelvin. Cool? All right. So that's nice. But anyway, when you talk about the value of the temperature and in most equation that we are going to face, you are going to use the Kelvin scale most of the time. All right. Very nice. Okay. And of course, you might still have other units or other scales still using being used today. But I think the only country left using it is more of a, probably the United States, I guess. All right, so that's Fahrenheit. So don't worry too much about it if you're not using it everywhere else. But good things to know is at 40 below, that's when the Celsius and Fahrenheit scale is reading the same numbers. So that means negative 40 Celsius is the same as negative 40 Fahrenheit. FYI. <laughs> All right, it's pretty cool already. I mean, the coldest that I've ever been, probably negative 30 or negative, I don't remember exactly, but it's negative 30 or 35 or something, Fahrenheit. Yeah. So that's the coldest that I have ever experienced. All right, guys. So what's the, the consequence of knowing this whole thing? First thing first, now we know what temperature is trying to tell you, right? It's trying to tell you about the total kinetic energy of the system. It's, it's the same thing. They are exactly the same thing. And then the thing is, your temperature range is huge. You can start from super, super low, even though you cannot reach zero, but you can get super low, even though nowadays you can go even like nano Kelvin already. So nano is 10 to the negative nine. So that is super low from, I mean, from the, uh, in, in the lab and stuff like that. So the way that you can reach that low, one way of doing it, you can think of it in terms of, you might have heard of the word laser cooling. Even though it sounds conflicting a little bit, you use the laser, but somehow how can laser cool down things? It's not much in the sense that all you want, you want your system to stop moving. That's your take on it. The lower that you can get in temperature, is by you are lowering the speed of your system. That's the whole thing. And that's why they use the laser beam. It's the multi-directional laser beam to stop the motion of the molecules. So when the molecules sort of like move very slowly, the temperature drops close to zero as well. Does that make sense? All right, so 
that gives you a close connection between the motion of the molecules and the temperature directly. Okay, and beyond that. You can now look at maybe liquid helium. That's when helium turns from gas to liquid. It's about maybe 2K, 2 Kelvin. Liquid hydrogen and liquid nitrogen, this one is easy to see. You can make ice cream out of this. Let's say it's about 77K already, somewhere around there. The copper, water, everything is somewhere around our, it's not our room temperature, of course, but it's somewhere around temperature that we're familiar with. It's somewhere around like 100 degrees Celsius. Copper melts at maybe seven, eight hundred degrees Celsius, on and on. So it's in the range of hundred to thousand Kelvin. And now, when you reach the surface of the sun, that's about you know order of thousand degree Kelvin already. But then, when you look at the corona, the activity that's happening on the surface of the sun or on uh, uh, around the sun, that you reach a million already. And if you get interior of the sun, when you get inside you get to you know, talk about the nuclear reactions, all of those you know, activity that's going on inside the sun that allow you to reach a 10 million Kelvin there. And believe it or not, man-made hydrogen bomb at the center of that bomb after the explosion, it can reach up to like 100 million Kelvin there. That's super, of course, it's a nuclear reaction there. So it's huge in temperature. All right, so those are the scales. You can see that it's, it's pretty big, but the main goal of this whole thing is just you can now connect between the temperature and the movement of the molecules. And now think about the movement. I'll say there is a, a, some, some situation I want you to just imagine with me, right? It's probably not real, <laughs> but something that you can imagine along. So let's say you guys come into a room packed with your friend, okay? Like shoulder to shoulder pack, super, super, you know, packed in a room. And then suddenly I just turn off the air conditioner. <laughs> all right, so now our classroom is getting warmer and warmer. Now you're gonna get like, you know, all right, annoying now is like, okay, it's getting hot, it's getting warm here. I don't like it, you know, can you move away from me a little bit? And can you give us some space? You, you see what I'm saying? And then you sort of like, well, you know, feel uncomfortable and then you just have to move a little bit. That is a situation that happens in the molecules. <laughs> so when, when the molecules getting higher in temperature, it starts moving. So when it starts moving, it's going to pretty much like disturb the neighboring atoms. So the distance between neighboring atoms is going to get a little bit bigger because of the pushing, you know, and like, okay, stay away from me and stuff. And hence, when you zoom out, look at the macroscopic level, you are going to look at the expansion, okay? So even though in the microscopic scale, you might be looking at like an angstrom or you might be looking at the, the nano scale, but when you have a walker draw numbers of this, moving around, you know, pushing each other away, then eventually when you zoom out, you will be able to see the thermal expansion. So something will expand in front of your face. You can observe this one in like a millimeter scale or centimeter scale. You see the translation from microscopic to macroscopic level, see? Okay, so this is stuff that we can do something about it and do some calculation on top of this. So what we are going to introduce today is how can we quantify the thermal expansion that is happening? Due, when you say thermal, it means it's due to the temperature change. Okay, so let's take a look at this. It's gonna be simple, guys. You have a piece of maybe a metal, you know, some substance, whatever. Your initial length is L naught, and then you warm this piece up by maybe burning it, give it some heat and all this stuff. We'll talk more about what is heat next time. But at least now you know temperature is getting higher, so this bar or this piece of object is gonna expand. So when it expands, there will be a new length, or there is a change of the length. So if you want to sort of like, hey, Ajahn, I would like to calculate this delta L, the change in the length, what could it be? So now you just come up an idea like, okay, Ajahn, what will be the factor that determine the delta L? First thing of first, what is the size of the temperature change for sure, right? Okay. Because of course, I mean, the higher the temperature change, I mean, the longer it's going to get because of the some expansion is happening. So that's cool. Another thing is, what is going to be your initial length? If you come up with like a, a, a meter long 
bar, then the expansion will be, let's say, some number. But if you compare this one meter bar with like a kilometer bar, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, the expansion is going to be growing along with that length. So it's supposed to be proportional to the initial length that you bring in the bar or bring in the, the object right there. What else? Well, Adan, could it be, it depends on what type of material you're talking about. Some material expand quickly. Some, ex, some material doesn't want to expand at all. So there must be some sort of like a numbers that sort of like give you the ability of that material to expand. So we are going to name this coefficients of linear expansion. Let me name this alpha. That's it. And one thing that you can see is everything just comes from my, my, <laughs> my, you can call this like my proposal here. <laughs> this is not like a law of physics or a law of the universe or anything. It's just, it's just like experimental, or it could be like, you can call it like, it's just from observation or something. So I can just wrap this whole thing and put them into an equation and be done with. So I can say the change of the length is just alpha, the coefficient of linear expansion times the initial length times delta L and I'm done. And now there, uh, there must be a couple of questions popping in your head, I'm, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> but Dan, wait a second. What about the height? What about the depth over here? You don't care? Of course, I care. Eventually, they are going to expand. Okay, that's one thing. And the second thing, but Dan, how do you know they are linear? Don't, like, isn't it possible that it's going to follow like square law? Or maybe could it be like two thirds and stuff, <laughs> right? So there are so many questions popping up and that is a very good question. Every question are good questions. Okay, and there's a question comes in, why ice shrink? That's also very good. So when melted, yeah. And that is perfect. I just gonna jump right ahead, spoiler alert over here. I already have that prepared for you. The reason that ice sort of shrink or water going funny business because of my points over here. This equation is not equation that's governed this universe at all. <laughs> Does that make sense? This is like, well, it's, it's experimental or it's just a model that try to explain something that expand with temperature change linearly. It's not as big as e sigma f equal to ma is not as big as what, what else do we have? I don't know, right? You know, Einstein relativity equation or no, this is just, just for the purpose of explaining things using mathematics or, you know, some expression, that's all. All right, so I hope you, you understand my point over here. So don't take this equation too seriously. And I'm going to answer, how can we deal with the other dimensions? But at least if you are talking about a single dimension, like here, the length, yeah, all right, I care only this length. I want to know what is the change in this length. I just can, I can just use this linear equation and be done with, cool? All right, and to answer your question about water, water is so crazy. I mean, you know, it's a hydrogen bond, H2O, it's liquid, you know, there is some, you know, interaction between them, blah, blah, blah. And it turns out everyone knows that the density of water is highest somewhere around four degrees Celsius. So let's say, I mean, if you come up with the, <laughs> if you're standing right there at four degree, as you can see, no matter which direction you go in temperature, you can increase the temperature or you can decrease the temperature, your density will be dropped. It will be dropped no matter which direction of the temperature change. So you're going to expand on both sides anyway. Okay, you see my point here? My point over here is don't take this equation too seriously, guys. This is just you can think of it like an engineering purposes, or you can just think of it just a modeling for taking to account, uh, try to quantify the, the, the thermal expansion. That's all. Cool. All right, guys. So with that in mind, the good thing on this one is we have them in a linear form. We love linearity. Okay. <laughs> we love it. We mean for those that are doing like computer science and computer engineering people, right? When you do linear stuff, I mean, computer is good at adding, subtracting numbers, that's fine. 
But once you do power, once you do multiplication, you take a lot more CPU time to do those. So that's why we love linearity. So with the coefficients value, you can look it up in this table. This table lists a little bit of the alpha value for those. Yeah, you have mostly uh, maybe metal, and then you have some here, concrete over here. And from this table, you can see that if you compare steel and concrete, they're having almost the same linear expansion coefficient. See that? And we love this one because, of course, when you have a, a reinforced the concrete with the steel reinforced, when you're building a skyscraper, all right, so you want those steel and concrete on those buildings to expand and contract at the same rate. So that's why the engineers have to come up with, you know, the material that's sharing the same value of the alpha, right? Otherwise, then you're going to have some problems. The steel might popping up or concrete will crack or whatever crazy stuff, okay? And this is like a, a, a consequence of the, the thermal expansion over there. You get cracks, you get, you know, bumps and everything. And this one is the worst. And I'm not so sure why I'm still puzzling about this figure over here, but this is a classic uh, photo explaining um, um, the, I think it's the mistake, engineering mistakes that they forgot to leave some space between metal bars generating the, uh, building the railway over here. But the only thing that I'm pus pus puzzled about this, this photo over here is, I don't know why they can complete the project <laughs> without having this effect during the construction. I don't know why. It seems like they're already in operation here, right? There's a, you know, some trains running on it and now it's get wrecked and everything. So I don't know. All right, but this one is obvious. They now, I mean, they have to put it in, in a block and then they have to leave some space to take care of the expansion during the, the hot day, yeah, on and on. All right, guys, so here we go. Now, if I want to take into account the expansion in other dimensions, so what done, you have the length, what about the height? What about the width? Yeah, well, I can do that. And what I can do is I can turn the original volume into a new volume by adding the extra volume into it. So the volume must be changed as well. So you can speak in terms of the volume change. Why not? Now here comes the question. What should be the expression for the delta V? Can you guess? <laughs> All right. No need to guess. It's already there. See, right there. But are you surprised by this equation? You must be surprised a little bit, I think. But then why this one look exactly the same as the delta L? <laughs> right? You now have another coefficient, and this one is just the coefficients for the volume expansion, because now you're talking about volume. But then you still multiply by the original volume that you started out with, and then you multiply by the change of the temperature that this whole volume is being, you know, gone through. It's still linear, Dan. But isn't it supposed to be like the width, the height, the length multiply each other? And then don't we expecting like a cubic function in here? And I'm going to show you right now what happened, guys. So let's do some math today for fun. Okay. So initially, at T naught temperature, the length, the width, the height give you the volume. No problem. That's fine. Now, what I'm going to do is this. Now I raise the temperature by delta T. So that's your new temperature. It's going to be T naught plus delta T. Now each length with height will expand on itself by linear equation that we learned. You guys with me? So that means talking about the length, the length will increase by delta L and delta L is just alpha L delta T. That's good. That's your new length. Same thing happens with the width. The width starting from W, then you just add to the change of the width. It's going to be alpha original width delta T. Cool. No big deal. The height doing the same thing. The new height is going to be the original height multiplied by the change in the height alpha H delta T. Now, this is going to be your new volume, right? Okay. okay. No big deal. However, you can see that they're sharing the same common factor over here. So what I'm saying is if I pull L from the first parenthesis here, I'm going to be left with one plus alpha delta T. In the second one, second parenthesis here, if I pull out the W, I'm going to be left with one plus alpha delta T as well. 
third one, if I pull H out, I am left with just one plus alpha delta T. So this means I have triple one plus alpha delta T. So that's why I ended up with one plus alpha delta T cubed. Where does this cubic function go? No. <laughs> Where does this one go? And here we go. The first approximation for the course right here. So we're going to do some approximation right now. So I don't know, have you seen this before? The approximation say when you have one plus X to the N, it's approximately equal to one plus NX. I don't have you seen this before. If not, that's fine, but you must be familiar with this. The complete square. Okay. If you do the cubic of this, so you're gonna have one cube plus what? 3x plus 3x squared plus x cubed. If you do the fourth power, you're going to have 1 plus 4x plus 6x squared plus 4x cubed plus x to the fourth. On and on and on, right? Okay, you guys still familiar with this. Then you notice something here. Number two, number three, number four. Those numbers will show up in the first term after number one. When I say first term after number one, mean they are all in linear terms. These are all linear on X. And the rest of this one, well, let me get rid of this. Why? If X is small, whoa. So what I'm saying over here is this. If X is, eh, let's say X equal to like 0 0.001, for example, let's say. So you square these numbers, it will go to the sixth digit already. If you cube this number, it will go to the ninth digit. If you do the fourth power of this one, it will go even further. So as long as X is a small number, then I'm just going to say, well, hey, Dan, just forget about this. <laughs> Does that make sense to you now? That's called approximation. And this one, you can name it, you, know, you can call it like a linearization. Linearize means you just only keep the term that is linear up to the first power, and you're going to throw away the higher power, higher order term. So that's why I can approximate this parenthesis over here with the cubed function to be approximately is just 1 plus 3 alpha delta t. Cool? And I just multiply things back over here. And what this first term means that is your original volume so no doubt whatever you have in the second part of this expression over here it will represent your delta v and that's conclude why i can write my delta v to be just this equation over here it's all linear and this emphasizing my point this expression over here is just an approximation <laughs> okay, don't take this equation too seriously. All right, because you guys can always do better by taking into account the higher order terms. Plus, keep in mind that originally you already throw in some approximation or something that's that doesn't, it's not a universal thing. Like your friend just pointed out, water doesn't follow this equation all the time, something like that. Okay, guys, so I hope. This one give you an enough introduction to thermal expansions, both in the linear one. I mean, linear, they're all linear, of course. But in terms of like just the length, one dimension, expansion, or you're going to do volume in three dimension if you like. So one conclusion you can draw from this one is three alpha shows up right here. And that give you the beta over here. So I can draw the conclusion that as long as the substance expands equally, in all dimensions, all directions, then the beta, the coefficients of volume expansion is gonna be three times the alpha. That's all, cool? Okay. All right, that's a question comes in, John, for this to be an accurate estimation, does delta T have to be really small? Luckily, the one that need to be small turns out to be alpha. Because if you look at these alpha value, see, good things. <laughs> it's 10 to the negative 6. 
So you seem to be okay. If delta T is like 10 or you know, 100, you're still look, talking about alpha delta T of 10 to the negative fifth or whatever, something like that. Yeah. So the one that responsible for small value is alpha. So that's still good. All right. Great question there. Okay, guys. Now, before we move on, actually, we almost done, but it's just going to throw in a little bit into the mix, right? If you don't do any calculus in college physics, that's kind of like you're losing something here, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So this course will include calculus with no extra charge right there. Right. So we have that for you. So what we can do very simply if, okay, let me look at the three-dimensional case over here. If I start with a cube of length L, so you have a volume of L cube over there. What I can do is I can look at the differential change of the volume with respect to the length, because I assume that the length is going to expand or contract. So I can write this one in terms of like a, you think of it as chain rule. So the change in the volume can be written in terms of the change in the volume with respect to the length and then multiply by the change in the length. So far so good. All right. Now, the good thing about this one is every time you talk about the delta, delta is the change. So it's big. But then when you do things very small, you turn it into D, a differential. So this means when things very, very small, super, super, duper small. So you turn everything into D. And this one is, I can say, is guaranteed to be linear. <laughs> okay. Because you already incorporate, you built in the smallness of stuff, right? And it's perfect. I mean, when this thing... This higher order term is super, super duper small. Everything will be super duper duper accurate. All right. So that's why when you do calculus, everything is just perfect, right? Because you assume everything approaching zero. So over here, we're going to work under calculus type thing. So everything is supposed to be approaching zero. So the change of the volume is just dv by dl times dl. Now, dv by dl, everyone knows how to differentiate this, is 3l squared. Cool. And the DL over here, you can turn that alpha L naught delta T, you can turn it into alpha L DT when things are infinitesimally small, super, super small. So this one can be written down here. So it's an alpha L DT for DL. Whatever left in the front is 3L squared. Now I bring in the alpha, take the L, put it in together with the L square. So you're left with just three alpha L cubed DT. It looks, it looks nice, yeah? So L cubed over here, that's just original volume. Whatever you have left in the front, you can call it the beta. And now everything is just infinitesimally small. Then now you can expand everything back in terms of the delta. And you assume that, I mean, it's gonna take on the same expression here when you turn D into delta, and that's it. You get the same expression for the volume expansion. Sounds cool? Alrighty. All right. Nice. So that's what it is. And with this idea, then what you have for the two-dimensional, now you don't have to think, well, you have to think a little bit, but you don't have to worry about it anymore because I can tell you right away about, hey, John, if you want to find the aerial change, yeah, the expansion in the aerial, two-dimensional expansion, then the coefficients of aerial expansion is going to be two alpha, given that the expansion in the length and the width are exactly the same alpha. Done. Cool, guys? All right, so there's a question comes in. How did you turn DL into <laughs> delta T? <laughs> All right, guys, so it's not turning or anything. It's approximate again. Because we said when it's D, it's perfect. It's like, yeah, it's approaching zero. Everything is good. Everything is good. But then when we assume that, okay, let's that change to be not super close to zero. Well, but then we just ignore the higher order term. All right. I can approximate D to be delta and be done with. Does that answer your questions? It's kind of like a little bit, right? <laughs> it's like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll take it, you know approximate it and don't want to deal with the higher order term. I'm just going to call D to be delta and done. Something like that. Okay. All right. So that, that's an approximation built in. All right, cool. 
All right, so this uh, table is showing you the uh, coefficient of volume expansion for the beta. As you can see, usually we use beta for volume. So around, we use like for liquid, for example, or maybe gas, something like that, okay? So when you talk about liquid or gas, usually you talk about the volume of it, okay? And one application of thermal expansion that you might not see nowadays anymore <laughs> is it's called bimetallic strip in thermostats. Thermostat is the device that control the temperature. Like when it's so hot, you want to turn it down. When it's too cold and you want to warm it up. So you want to switch that response to the temperature change. Okay, so that's just like the, the old air conditioner. It works this way. So when the room is getting hotter, you want to switch on your AC. And when the room is already cold, you just want to turn off. Okay, so that was like a fixed motor uh, air conditioner there. Okay, so the way that it works, you just have, it's a bimetallic. So it means you use two types of metal, like here, may, uh, steel and brass, and they have this different alpha. So it means when you go through the same delta T, it will expand at a different value. And that's why it's going to bend. That's it. So that's nice. So with that, then you can attach this bimetallic into the switch and that you can, you know, put a logic in there and when it's hot, you want to turn on when it's cold, when you want to turn off, on and on. All right. So this is thermostat using physical thermal expansion to control the switch. All right. But nowadays, you use electronics and all this stuff anymore. So you, you don't see a lot of this. All right. However, it might work at some, you know, extreme conditions such that electronics might not, you know, might not behave properly. Maybe some place that is super, super hot, for example, then you might still want to use thermostat this way. Okay. All right. Oh, there's so a couple of people asking about attendance. No, there'll be no attendance. No, not. No. <laughs> so you guys can come in and leave lecture at any time or doesn't show up at all. That is fine. Yeah, just want to confirm that one. Okay, so we do usual thermal expansion with rice cooker though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, that's kind of tough. See, that's, that's emphasizing my point. <laughs> because when you're cooking the rice, the structure of the rice is actually changing. Right? You're not doing like a, 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 a like uniform expansion. <laughs> it's complicated. It's like, yeah, I don't know. All right. Uh, that's, that's a good example. <laughs> the classic thermometer also uses it. Yeah, yeah, right. The classic thermometer and everything you can still use uh, expansion and everything. So uh, if you look at the first figure, right there, um, here, over here, right? So like mercury thermometer, they still apply the, the thermal expansion. So when the temperature is rising, then that extra, I mean, the expansion will run into this tube over here. And then you can read out the scale from there. Yeah, so the thermal expansion is still used in, in classic thermometer over here. Yeah, cool. All right, guys, very nice. All right, so just toward the end of today's lecture, let's do a simple questions. All right, and this is the exception for waters. That actually, there are so many exceptions, like some weird polymers, some exotic ceramic, and all the stuff. <laughs> They're not gonna follow this simple law of expansion. It's not even a law, right? It's just an expression for linear expansion. So, don't take this equation too seriously, guys. Okay. All right. So, it's final page for today's lecture, guys. I'm just gonna leave with this question, all right? And then we'll do some calculation on Saturday, right? Just use it as a review and just doing some numerical examples. Okay, so you have two spheres that are made of the same metal and have the same radius. Okay, one is hollow, so this means they probably, you know, some big hole in there, and one is solid, so it's a thick solid piece of this. So if they are going through the same temperature change, which one will expand more? What do you think? Mm. So this one is in the same line of question. If you have a piece of metal, think of it like a two-dimensional sheet, and then you have a hole in between or at the center, what happens if you warm this thing up? What will happen to the hole? Something like that. 
Okay, the same line of question over here. So the answer is simple. Don't think too much. Everyone seems like, well, there's a hole in there. So maybe it's string a little bit <laughs> because it seems like everything expands, right? But when I say expansion, you want to think of this expansion like you're doing a Photoshop enlargement. So it's like you want to scale up the, the whole figure over there, something like that. So that's mean no matter what happened to this one, everything will get expanded out equally. So the answer is they're going to be the same expansion, no matter what. So I can sort of like give you a, a, a better explanation by looking at this. If I am a single molecule in this sphere, okay, or atoms, whatever build up this whole sphere over there, I am not going to be able to tell is this sphere is hollow or solid, right? <laughs> no way. I am so like million, million, million molecules away from the hollow, I mean, from the hole or whatever. So for me, what I can do every time that temperature is rising, I'm going to push my neighboring around. I'm like, hey, hey, get away from me here, guys. You know, get out. <laughs> so locally, I'm going to push things apart. That's all. So that's all I know. So that's why everything will expand in an equal sort of like value. So what I'm saying over here is at the end, this thing is going to get a little bit larger and it's going to expand out. It's just like you're doing like a, a zoom in. Over here, it's going to expand out in the same value. Cool? All right, understand that? Same thing over here. If you have a plate, a sheet, and then you warm this sheet up, then the whole sheet is going to expand. This hole never going to get smaller. That's impossible. Right? If you think that, hey, that is expand in all directions, so this means this hole is going to get shrinked down, that's not possible because, once again, if I am the molecules at the edge of this hole, and if I say, hey, I want to shrink it down, it means these molecules or these atoms are going to have to have, like, I don't know, pull everything towards it, <laughs> which is not possible. No way. The majority of the molecules in the sheet. So when the sheet expands, they're going to expand all together. All right. So maybe a better way of thinking about this one is instead of having a hole, I'm not having any hole. I'm just drawing some something on this piece of sheet, whatever. If it's just a drawing, everyone will agree with me. Once I warm this sheet up, this drawing is going to expand, right? <laughs> so is it a hole or not a hole? They will all expand. So that's my take on this one. So the whole thing will expand. This drawing or this hole is going to expand along with it. That's mine. Okay. All right. So thermal expansion is just think of the enlargement when you do a Photoshop or whatever the app that you zoom in into the stuff right there. Okay, guys. Okay. Last question. And then we just, I will just let you guys go. The aluminum tube is 33 uh, meter long at 20 degrees Celsius. What is the length at 40 and what is the length at zero? So this whole point is a plug and play example. This is not gonna show up in the exam for sure, <laughs> too easy. But the point of this one, I just wanna showcase that the delta T that you're using can be positive because in case A, you're going from 20 to 40, so the temperature is increasing. Or in part B, the delta T could be negative, that is fine. So it could be a, an, an increase in length or it can be a decrease in length, all right? But the rest, you just plug in the value and then you will be done. The change of the length in part A is just the original length times the alpha of the aluminum, L0, and the delta T. You plug in the value for the alpha using the value in the table, plug in three in there, plug in delta T, then you have the increase in length. And if you do it for part B, it will look exactly the same, except it's going to be the negative value of part A, and you are done. Cool, guys? All right, guys. So I think that is it for today's, and I think this is good enough introduction among us, <laughs> seeing each other and then understand what this course is about to offer you guys. Okay, guys? Thank you for sticking around, and I will see you guys on Saturday, yes? Okay, bye-bye, guys. Take care.